Senator Mike Lee is currently the youngest serving member in the United States Senate. Senator Lee is considered one of the strongest conservatives in the United States Senate and has the highest rating by the American Conservative Union. Welcome, Senator Lee. Thank you. Senator Lee, a lot of politicians want America to move toward balancing its budget. You've written a book claiming a link between a balanced budget and the restoration of constitutional government in the United States. What do you mean by that exactly? Well, I decided to run for the U.S. Senate because I've come to believe the federal government's too big and too expensive, in part because it's been doing too many things it was never intended to do. When our founding fathers sat down 224 years ago, they outlined a few basic powers that they knew had to be exercised at the federal level. And they came up with that list. It's found primarily in Article I, Section 8. We've drifted far from that understanding that Congress is supposed to be exercising those powers and only those powers. I don't think Congress will find its way toward restricting its own power again until it no longer has an unlimited pool of money from which to draw. So we allow Congress to borrow to the tune of $1.5 trillion a year. It'll continue doing this. But the minute we start to restrict Congress's borrowing power, then and only then will it, in my opinion, start to look back to the Constitution and say, what are we supposed to do? What is our power? But how do you propose restricting this borrowing power? I've proposed it in the form of Senate Joint Resolution 10, a balanced budget amendment proposal that has been co-sponsored by all 47 Republicans in the Senate. We have dozens and dozens of mm -hmm. uh, uh, sponsors in the House of Representatives as well. And what it says, in effect, is that Congress may not spend more than it takes in, in a year, may not raise taxes, may not spend more than 18 percent of GDP in, in a given year uh, uh, without a supermajority vote in Congress. And I think that's what we need. That needs to be our next constitutional amendment, and I'm doing everything I can to push this forward. Do you think it has a chance? I do. I, I know it's a long shot. People are fond of saying that it's a long shot or that it can't happen. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, 75% of the American people want a balanced budget amendment. They want Congress to live by the same rules that govern Americans in their own homes and in their state legislatures. They want that here. They want it now. What do you think the major obstacle is to getting it done? I think a lot of the major obstacle is the fact that members of Congress are accustomed to spending in unlimited sums of money. They're accustomed to wanting to please constituents by throwing money at problems, regardless of where those problems originate. And they don't want to part with that power. People, it turns out, are reluctant to become less powerful. And we would be becoming less powerful if we passed this. But as we become less powerful, the American people become more powerful. That's why it's going to work in the end. Now, you've put together the Constitutional Conservative Fund to help achieve some of these goals. It's a super PAC. And you've been heavily criticized for it. First of all, what is a super PAC? And can you really take unlimited contributions? First of all, this is not a super PAC, at least as of right now, it's not a super PAC. We've sought permission to become one. We will see. A super PAC is a political action committee that can raise funds in unlimited sums, uh, not bound by the same restrictions as we have to follow under the Federal uh, Elections Commission promulgated regulations. So uh, we have applied for permission to become a super PAC. We have not yet been granted that. I'm not sure whether it will happen or not. But the purpose of the Constitutional Conservatives Fund is to find and support and help secure the election of Senate candidates around the country who share my view of constitutionally limited government, who share my view that the answer to a lot of the problems confronting America right now, especially our $15 trillion debt, has everything to do with that 224-year-old document that has fostered the development of the greatest civilization the world has ever known. I'm looking for candidates who will support that position. And we found a few of them so far. Ted Cruz in Texas, Jeff Flake in Arizona, Dan Bongino in Maryland, and Don Stenberg in Nebraska. We're on the lookout for others, and we'll be announcing other nominations in the next few months. There is a super committee. The super committee is charged with cutting our deficit. Will it succeed? And if it doesn't succeed, automatic cuts begin. I don't know whether it will succeed. And although I have my doubts, and I've been very vocal and public about my doubts, it feels a little bit unfair for me to predict disaster right now before they've even had a chance to propose anything. I have, however, uh, expressed real concern over the fact that bad things are likely to happen when you have a 100-member Senate and a 435-member House of Representatives. And uh, you consolidate the power, a significant amount of that power, of both of those bodies down into a committee of 12. 
a committee of 12 that will operate, for the most part, in secret, uh, not with any sunlight, not with the disinfecting and illuminating quality of sunlight, and will propose something at the end of the day that will have to be voted up or down on a binary basis without any opportunity for amendment. That's dangerous. Will they propose something, you believe? They'll propose something. Oh, so you think they will reach a conclusion? They will reach a conclusion. I just don't know what it is yet. Now, to show you how little um, support there is for engaging in any real cutting behavior right mm -hmm. now, just last week, Congress passed what's known as a minibus, a, a, a partial appropriations measure. Uh, and, and in this minibus that funded a few programs, it, it spent about $10 billion more for fiscal year 2012 than Congress had spent mm -hmm. for the same programs in fiscal year 2011. And this is a problem because at the same time this was happening, people were talking about how much had been cut. Mm -hmm. I introduced an amendment, uh, uh, an amendment to it uh, called an, uh, an amendment uh, with instructions to recommit, a motion to recommit this same bill back to the Appropriations Committee, instructing the Appropriations Committee to send the thing back with numbers at least no higher than what we had spent in fiscal year 2011. Hardly an ambitious, hardly an overly aggressive mm -hmm. measure, and yet even it failed. So if Congress can't cut even $10 billion, I don't know how it's going to cut $1.2 trillion. The super committee, if they don't reach a conclusion, have automatic cuts that take place. Some of these cuts really cut the military dramatically. We're here at the Citadel. A lot of the cadets here will be joining the military after their graduation. What can we tell them about the military cuts? Are they going to happen? Should they happen? I, I think there is a decent chance that they could happen, and that possibility really does worry me. One of the few things that the federal government is supposed to do is to provide for our national defense. I don't see any reason why we should take the lion's share of those cuts, or the biggest single chunk, chunk out of them, out of national defense, when that's one of the few things we are supposed to be doing. Uh, that said, I do agree with the principle that we've got to put in place something that get, gets cut no matter what. I, I personally don't think those will take effect. I think Congress will find another way. Perhaps it's through the Super Committee. Perhaps it's through other legislation that will exempt Congress out of this. And this is the point I make in the Freedom Agenda. In my book, I explained that without a constitutional amendment to back up these kind of mandatory cuts, you'll find Congress guarding its, its own rules. That which Congress giveth, Congress taketh away. And if Congress wants to change the rules, it can. And it, it's easy for Congress to do that, and as long as what we're talking about is statutory rather than constitutional. Here at the Citadel, a lot of cadets will be joining the military, as I've just mentioned. How can you guarantee them? What assurances can you give them that their sacrifices for our country will be in the best interests of our country? Obviously, there are no absolute guarantees, or at least very few in this life, other than de death and taxes. Uh, but what I can tell them is that I, every single day that I serve in the United States Senate, I remember that oath that I took to the U.S. Constitution. I remember that I took an oath to uphold it, and that I took an oath to honor those principles embodied in there, e including the fact that we are required as U.S. Senators and members of Congress uh, to provide for the national defense of the United States of America. I hope to find more people with the same commitment to our constitutional responsibilities. We need to re-energize that focus. And that's why I've started this PAC, and uh, that's why I encourage people to go to fundconservatives.com to find out what we're doing. You've made some controversial proposals on immigration. Um, you want to grant a three-year visa to foreign nationals who purchase expensive homes in the U.S., and also to foreign workers willing to work on dairy and sheep farms. How do these proposals benefit America and, and Americans? Well, first of all, we have to remember that the immigration problem that we have in this country is due in part to the fact that we have made legal, lawful immigration so difficult, so time-consuming, and so uncertain that it's broken the system and it's resulted in widespread illegal immigration. It's become easier and easier because these are, laws are so hard to comply with and cheating them, violating them, has become so easy that we've incentivized exactly the wrong kind of activity. So I've started uh, recognizing that there is very little, if any, appetite for comprehensive immigration reform in Congress right now. I've started by taking a, a few surgical strikes to the process. I found one problem in the area of uh, dairy farm employees and, and uh, people who work on sheep farms, uh, she, uh, sheep ranches. Mm -hmm. um, 
they, they were coming into this country with seasonal agricultural worker visas. And in these industries, the workers are needed not on a seasonal basis, but on a year-round basis. Three years seemed like a better pattern than a, than, than a simple agricultural season. In the case of the other measure, I think if somebody wants to come to the United States and wants to invest $500,000 or more in a house and pay cash for it, no mortgage, they ought to be able to visit that home. It makes sense, especially if they can pass a criminal background check and satisfy the other prerequisites that all of our immigrant and non-immigrant visa holders, these would be non-immigrant, uh, ha have to pass. It makes sense to me, and so I introduced legislation to do that. You've been, again, outspoken on the deficit and the need for deficit reduction. If you had a magic wand, what would you cut first? Well, the first thing I would do is uh, put in place a constitutional backstop, making sure that it Let would Let me happen. correct that. Yes. If you were in the position to do it, no magic wand. We need somebody in a position to. Yes, uh, because we in America don't operate through magic wands, and no one has all the authority. But we need Congress to act to propose a balanced budget amendment. We need three-fourths of the state legislatures to ratify that. Once that's in effect, then those things will happen. There is no consensus now as to how we get to that point. But let me start with some big picture right, examples. Put, let's put the consensus aside. What would you do sure. if you were in the position where you could do it? What I'd like to see is move, uh, see us move toward a premium support model with regard to Medicare. If we move so to, Obamacare goes. Obamacare goes. Uh, that's got to go right off the top of the bat. Uh, we start transitioning Medicare into a premium support model uh, uh, consistent with what was discussed in the Ryan plan. That would enable us to, to, to save a significant amount of money uh, enough money that when accompanied with other cuts that we could make in other areas, I think we could get ourselves on a smooth glide path toward balancing our budget within a few years. Uh, we can't do it overnight, but I think we could do it in four, five, six years. Um, with regard to Medicaid, I believe we could make some cuts there in a way that wouldn't hurt the lower income people that benefit from Medicaid if we start block granting these programs back to the states. I've spoken with countless state legislators who have told me we can do more with less. But we need fewer federal regulations attached to it. We need federal regulations that will fit on one page saying this is to be used for health care, for the needy, uh, spend it well, don't, um, uh, don't do X, Y, and Z, but not thousands of pages of regulations telling them how to pay for it. So it, these are two examples of big picture spending categories in which we really could spend a lot of money. I could go into more detail on uh, how we could spend more money elsewhere, but the, the most important point to emphasize is that these discussions can occur, they will bear fruit, but they, they won't happen and they won't bear fruit until Congress is forced to do it. Because the pull in Congress is so strong toward wanting to spend more money. This is a major point that I emphasized in the Freedom Agenda, is that you can't expect Congress to do the right thing until it's constitutionally compelled to do so. Fortunately, 75% of all Americans want Congress to do that thing, which is to restrict its own authority through an amendment. What's your future hold for you other than the United States Senate? Any plans? Well, I hope to continue. By the way, you have an outstanding background. You were a Supreme Court clerk. I was. Uh, you, are, you have done amazing things in your life thus far. Any, any future plans? Well, m my plans are, at least for the f next five years, I can uh, intend to continue representing the good people of Utah. And uh, depending on what happens in the 2016 election cycle, if, if they're willing to give me a, a chance to serve again, perhaps another six years after that. In the meantime, I hope to continue, hope to continue being a good husband and father and neighbor back home in Utah. Uh, but, you know, th this is a difficult time for our country, and uh, I, I continue to believe our best days are yet ahead of us. They really are. This will continue to be the greatest land on earth, but only if we make the right choices now. We have to start making these difficult decisions now. They will be difficult, they will be gut-wrenching, but they are absolutely necessary. And our survival, our prosperity as a nation depend upon it.